Okay, there we go. So in First Timothy, I, I, you you can you have to look, you have to see it as as a young pastor in a very difficult situation in a difficult place, and Timothy has obviously communicated somehow to uh, Paul previously that you know what I think I'm done here. It's time to move on, and so I think. Most every pastor has probably gone through that exact situation. And um, we'll see what, what Paul tells Timothy here in just a little bit. But it's interesting that uh, uh, First Timothy, First and Second Timothy, is what's called a pastoral epistle. So it's, it's a letter, not just... It, it, to a group of general people, but it is a pastoral epistle written to Timothy. It's a letter. Timothy, here's your word. Here's what you need to do. It's an encouragement. Um, it, it is to one fella. Uh, Paul did that again with Titus. Uh, that's called a pastoral uh, epistle. And, um, uh, so it, it's it's very focused in that regard, not necessarily meant for everyone's eyes, but certainly useful as as we'll see. Uh, so it's unlike the uh, other epistles that he wrote, other letters he wrote to, like for instance, First and Second Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, generally to the church. Uh, but this is a pastoral epistle. So all right, I beat that dead horse. Um, Paul first met Timothy in, we see, in Acts 16. His grandmother was Lois. She was a Jewish Christian. Um, his mother was Eunice, a Jewish Christian. Uh, he came from Lystra in the province of Galatia, which is modern-day Turkey. Uh, and his father was a Greek uh, and he was probably not a believer. Uh, Timothy was in Ephesus, and he oversaw a group of churches in the region of Ephesus. So it was, we don't know if it was a, a mega church, probably not, because everybody met in like houses, you know, they didn't have big buildings. So he probably oversaw a number of churches, and nobody knows how many that was. Uh, Ephesus was a uh, it was a commercial center of Asia Minor. It was uh, the second largest city in the Roman Empire and possibly the second largest city in the world at that time. Uh, so it had several hundred thousand people. So as far as large cities compared to today, not not even close. You look at New York, you know, with what is it, eight million or whatever, but. For that time, that was a big city, a couple of hundred thousand people. It was known for magic and the Temple of Diana, which was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, and it's one of those um, Greek looking buildings that sit up on a, like the, uh, what do they call it, the Parthenon? Uh, it kind of looks like that, mm -hmm. that kind of a building. It's, you know, you could fit a football stadium inside of it. It's huge kind of a thing. So, all right. Uh, and from a big perspective, uh, Timothy, First Timothy is built in four major sections. Um, first of all, it starts out with the message of the church, basically the doctrine of the church. And then uh, chapter two talks about members of the church. Chapters three and four are ministers of the church. Chapters five and six are ministry of the church. And so, you know, we're going to see qualifications for elders and deacons and um, just kind of how the church should operate. Um, pretty good stuff. Pretty important. Um, it's interesting that without Timothy, um, 
Uh, well, without Paul, honestly, if you just look at uh, the writings of the other apostles, um, you're not going to see a lot of church stru structure, to be honest. Um, so thankful for, for what Paul wrote down and what he was, I'm sure what he was learning and seeing and observing, it was had a lot to go into it. Um, so let's start with uh, verses one and two. Um, Doug, would you start, please, sir? Certainly. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God, our Savior, and of Je uh, Christ Jesus, our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. All right. This seems like a general greeting, but one guy brought out, I think his name is David Guzik, uh, brought out a really good point that um, uh, being a pastoral ep epistle, Paul sends grace, mercy, and peace only to Timothy and Titus. So the, the two pastoral epistles, he sends grace, mercy, and peace. To the churches when he's writing to Corinth or whatever, he just only sends grace and peace. Kind of an indication that, you know, pastors need an, uh, an extra bit of mercy. And I think that's a pretty good um, uh, observance. That was, that was pretty good. Grace, mercy, and peace given to pastors. They got a tough job. And... Uh, so we, uh, we certainly need to lift them up. If you look at uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, it, it says that uh, we need to respect our, our pastors and uh, lift them up uh, because they have a very difficult job. So verse 3, um, verse 3, just, yeah, verses 3 and 4, uh, Ned? Thirdly, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. All right. It is clear that Timothy had communicated to Paul that, hey, this is tough out here. This is really, I think it's time to move on. I think, um, you know, I need to go over to Corinth because there's such great people over there or whatever. I got a, I got a call from a church in Corinth. I got to go. And, and Paul comes out real strong and he uses uh, the word charge and the Greek term that I understand is used is more like military order. No, I told you to stay. It wasn't a suggestion. Timothy, you are to stay there. And uh, I know that had to be hard for Timothy to read, especially as he was already, he had already sold his house, you know, he was already <laughs> talking to a realtor in Corinth or whatever. And you know, so he was already packing bags ready to go, but um, uh, he was told specifically by his mentor, no, you will stay there. Um, why did he tell him to stay in um, Ephesus? To charge certain persons not to teach a different doctrine. Uh, so now doctrine becomes important. This is only what? This is less than 30 years after the birth of the church. And already people are coming in trying to uh, mess with the doctrine, mess with what the church is supposed to be doing. Uh, it doesn't take long uh, for people to do so. Oh, and I mean, you see that. You see that even now. And you, you got to think. Uh, in with any organization, like look at the United States, some of the, the most trying days are early on where there there's so many different influences and so many different things that, you know, um, trying to get in there and put, you know, put their, their own mark on it. Yeah. And, and obviously in this case, you're talking about in, a, in an urban, like a big global city, 
with a lot of different religions, like certainly there's a lot of different influences there, cultural, mm-hmm. um, you know, cultural, religious, you know, influences there that are you know, trying to put their mark on the church. Yeah. Yeah. This is going to be big. I want my hand. Well, in, even, you know, mm-hmm. right. Well, even, even like, as I read that, what I was thinking, the first thing that came to my mind was like, we had, uh, discussed a couple weeks ago the eisegesic and the exegesic mm-hmm. um, interpretations mm-hmm. and that was the first thing that popped into my mind we'll use so much of this but we'll put a twist on it in order to benefit us mm-hmm. you know yep. Yep. The, uh, they seem to be teaching uh, one fellow said uh, let me see who this was here it was Mike uh, Mazzalongo brought out that uh, it seemed to be what they're talking about here is a heresy uh, teaching Gnosticism uh, Gnosticism kind of kind of worshipped knowledge uh, which was a mixing of different sources of knowledge kind of what you said Doug of philosophy mysticism and Christianity hey what could possibly go wrong right um, and it produced a doctrine of dualism. And um, so it's you know, Paul recognized real quickly, and T- Timothy, I'm sure, did after he read the letter, that you got to go back to the standard. What do you hear from all the, uh, uh, all the coaches that are trying to readjust their, their team that just lost a, a battle? Well, we got to go back to the basics. You know, it's a, it's you got to go back to the fundamental. The fundamental. Fundamentals. That's right. So, uh, that's that's what's what's happening here. They got to get back to the fundamentals. Um, let's see here. Uh, David Gusick said again: focus on the goal. Uh, the aim of the char aim of our charge, and so, um, this is doctrine matters. However, today, oh, look at this. Uh, today, people will will say something to the effect of, "Well, it doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe something." We've all heard our friends say that, right? Our sincere, wonderful humanist friends. Uh, as, as long as you believe something, it's okay, you know. <laughs> Actually, no, <laughs> it's not okay. Um, all right, we press on. Uh, I'll read uh, five and six and seven. Uh, now, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Uh, from which some have strayed, having uh, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. So you know, Paul was he was getting a little bit, um, uh, as they say in the South here, bowed up because there was nobody that understood the law better than than Paul. Uh, Paul was the man. And uh, he was the Pharisee of Pharisees. And these fellows were trying to use the law. Somebody said that um, uh, part of what they were teaching was probably trying to use the law, uh, maybe some Judaizer stuff, that kind of a thing. And uh, and we've talked about Judaizer stuff before where they try to bring in the law. Well, they can be Christians, but they have to, you know, be circumcised, all these other things, trying to make a mix of of a religion so eight through eleven uh doug now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully understanding this that the law is not laid down for the just but for the lawless and the disobedient for the ungodly and sinners for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, uh, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, 
perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Okay, so it, it almost sounds, if you, if you take this at surface level, it almost sounds like, okay, for those people who do this, then the law is in, is in line, right? It's only for those people. But for the righteous, then they don't, they don't need the law. But what he's really saying is, um, we're all under, uh, we all f are told that we're sinners by the authority of the law, right? Um, because those are just, a, those are just a, a small list of things that show us that we're sinners and we need, and we need a savior. So we're basically all shown to be sinners and we need a savior. Now, what savior is it that you're going to select? You know, if we know, if we realize that we're all unrighteous um, and we have a savior being Jesus Christ, who justifies us, I want to be careful how I say this, uh, then why should we stop doing what we're what what made us sinners what what labeled us as a sinner if we're justified by our savior i'm, I'm baiting you of course why not keep doing what we desire to do one more time and the, a lot of people will argue this by the way because we're justified in faith we're justified in faith. Okay, I'm justified in faith. Why can't I do one of the things that um, uh, that, that he lists off there? Why can't I uh, be a kidnapper? I want to. I desire to be a kidnapper. Why why can't I continue to do that and 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 be saved? Because we know it's the law. It's it's the law, but I mean, hey, I'm covered by I'm covered by the sacrifice of Christ. Why why should I, why should I stop? Well, because this tells us that we're supposed to do what's right and not against the law. Okay, I, I've, I, I've had the argument. Not, I mean, <laughs> I word hose up. <laughs> I know I've had the argument before. Somebody will say, you know, I, I really recommend you not doing this because they were they told me they were going to do this. I said, well, that's that's really against scripture. I I really recommend that you don't do that as a Christian, especially. Um, I, I really recommend that you don't do that, and uh, that's all right. I'm 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 saved by the blood. I'm. He'll, 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 he'll forgive me. That's a dangerous area to be. And if you go and look at, um, uh, like there's several places, but Romans six, See, I, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I think where I, I'm, what I'm trying to come up with now is, is, and I forget what part it is, but it says before there was law, there was no sin. But since there has been law, there is now sin. As early in Romans. If we know the that. law, mm -hmm. and we break the law, then we know we have sinned, and mm -hmm. we try not to sin. I know. But then you take Did that, that one step better? further. And his argument then was that, okay, now that I know that I'm a sinner. In other words, he was talking, Paul was talking about, um, now that I, you know, the law tells me about coveting, well, now I'm guilty of coveting, you know. Right. And but now that we have a savior, the argument can be, well, I'm covered. You know, I can do this now. I cannot change my lifestyle, whatever the situation is, because I'm covered by the blood of Christ. Going to Romans 6, 11 to 15, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Uh, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been bought 
uh, brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness for sin shall no longer be your master. Remember we talked about that because you are not under the law, uh, but under grace. What then shall we uh, sin because we are not under the law, but under grace by no means. So there's the, the end all argument to somebody who says, well, I'm, I'm under grace. I'm under the blood. Now I, I don't have to worry about stopping anything right uh certainly by no means it's kind of like and as i was working through this it's kind of like we buy fire insurance for our houses and if we don't like our house anymore or whatever we can we set fire to the house well it's it's fine i've got fire insurance (laughs) they'd be called illegal i don't think that's going to go so well um so uh, kind of a similar analogy, uh, but be ready with those arguments uh, as, as people come to you with that argument. And when you dare to suggest that they stop doing a certain thing. that So that would be like using uh, profanity. Sir? That would be profanity. like using profanity. Okay. Yeah, if you could define you could, what profanity may be is. there, you may want to do it, but you know not to do it. Yeah. Because of this. Yeah. Yeah. It, it. Yeah. With profanity, it's 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 a little hard, but it's um. Yeah. You, you get it. You would almost have to fall back on. Um, uh, does does it honor the Lord, in in the way you speak, you know. And uh, right, so yeah. So one of the things uh, back back in Romans, kind of, I, I noticed as you were clicking off, of, how are we? Uh, I pulled pulled it back up in verse seventeen. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart mm. to the the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. So it's about, like, I think that's kind of getting back at what compels us to uh, flee from sin or live a life, you know, away from sin or to, to reject sin. It's, for lack of a better word, and just using the language in Romans, because we're slaves to righteousness. We're slaves mm-hmm. to his righteousness. Our we are compelled by the Holy Spirit. And if we are, if we have truly been justified, we believe in the indwelling uh, of the Holy Spirit. We are the, the gaze and focus of our hearts is, is no longer on sin. Mm-hmm. It's on him. So yeah. it's about who we serve, right? That's right. We're a slave to something. We're getting back. Am I getting at the same thing? You're right on target. Right. We're, on, we're going to be a slave to something. And but, so we're going to be a slave to righteousness. Yeah. We all Vody, serve somebody. Yeah, Vody Botman uh, brought it out, and you go back to uh, the talk on, on 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 rights. There's a law thing on rights and and desires. He said that what we see today is uh, a lot of talk about well, it's my right to do X, Y, and Z, but they're confusing the 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 uh, their rights with their desires just because you desire some i desire my neighbor's boat that doesn't mean i can i have the right to go steal it you know um two very different different things vody bachman oh he's good he's so good we're picking up now in first timothy 1 verse 12 12 to 14 and Doug is going to read that particular section. Okay. <laughs> I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he has judged me faithful, appointing to me his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And grace, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me, with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Um, we got to remember that Paul was the former Osama bin Laden. 
I mean, he, he was Saul and he hated Christians with a passion. Um, now, wouldn't it have been awesome if Osama bin Laden had gotten saved and started on the rampage for Christ in the position that he was in? That would have been awesome. That would have been awesome. Um, 13, he mentions he obtained mercy because he didn't he did what he did ignorantly uh, in unbelief. And if we go over to um, Acts 26, 10, we'll look at, uh, we see some of his actions. I'll just read them. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So Paul was a bad dude. A bad Did he dude. Put, sorry, I've got mom's home. I may have to step away for a second when she pops in the house. But mm -hmm. um, remember correctly, Paul... Mm -hmm. Was it like Steve, Steve, Stefan? I, 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 I keep forgetting this. I keep pushing out. I know, is it Stefan? It's Stefan, right? Stephen. Mm -hmm. It's Stephen. I keep mispronouncing it. I don't know why. That's okay. Like, I'm, like it's, it's like S T E P H E N, but it, like it's Stephen. It's Stephen. Yeah. There's no V now, in there. Now, I say that, but. But the PH. You know, uh, 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 you know, that's why I've always heard it from every pastor, the, the stoning of Stephen and whatnot. But, hey, you know, if you want to say Stephen, well, I don't think anybody would holler too bad. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, like he persecuted, he, he was there when Stephen, when he, when he was killed <laughs> off. He was one of the people watching, like, gave his vote on that too, right? He was watching. He, he held the coats of the people yeah, that he watched them. Yep. Sure did. Yep. But uh, he did far more than that, according to himself. Yeah, he was he was a bad dude. But as we'll see in 14, as mentioned, uh, that he exceeded that the, his grace, the Lord offered him exceeded it, exceeded the bad that he did, which is really a wonderful example. You know, I've heard. You know, People say that I was, I've done so much bad that there's no way I could be forgiven. I really doubt they did more than more bad than what Paul did. I really, really doubt it. And obviously, it's the it's why the Lord called Paul the way He did, most likely, because um, He's a good example of what can be forgiven. And and that was on the road to Damascus. Well, and and the thing called yeah yes 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 sir mm -hmm. the the thing is is where it says but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief yeah and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me yeah he he was acting under the law of Abraham at that point wasn't he, he was to the he best was. of his knowledge and understanding yes sir so and he very good at it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So because of the fact that he was doing what he thought he was supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. his eyes hadn't been opened yet. Right, right. But we'll find out that they soon will be. They soon will be. That's right. Uh, 15 through 17. Jamal? Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy that so in me, the world's, the worst of sinners, um, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So there again, he's emphasizing, if I can be saved, anybody can be saved. That's, I think that's the key there. Uh, he recognized how deep his, his sin was. You guys see anything else there? Well, and, you know, understand that 
the beginning, the apostles, you know, the one apostle had, who was the tax collector? I, it Matthew. just, Matthew. Matthew. Mm -hmm. So his brother said, man, don't, don't talk to him, man. He's off the wall. And, and mm -hmm. so, you know, Jesus is going, this was a, this was so much a training for the new apostles. Because mm -hmm. most of this stuff, they never got. And really until after the crucifixion, right. a lot of this stuff made sense, but it was, it really never came together mm -hmm. with this. And then at one point in time, it all made sense. You know, it, 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 it clicked and, and they see that who, you know, you can take somebody that's just horrible. Mm -hmm. And here's an example. They'll go to the wall for us, yeah. for me, for you. And it was, you know, oh, don't associate with them. But as it became clear, everybody is eligible for this, mm -hmm. right? That's it. Everybody, no matter who. As a matter of fact, the worse they are, the more they need us. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, you know, all this stuff, of course, and in, in, in Jesus and his, his infinite wisdom, this was all things that just had to happen. And culminating to where they finally got it. And then, of course, eventually uh, was uh, Holy Spirit came upon them. Yeah, I think it's uh, and I think that's I think you just nailed it right there. The whole time they were following Jesus around for three years, uh, getting trained, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. I mean, they had the Holy Spirit in Jesus, but not in themselves. And so their understanding was just. It just wasn't there yet. And I don't think they were allowed to have the Holy Spirit until they understood most well, of until, it. Until Jesus went away and then sent yes. the Holy Spirit back. Yes. Exactly. Right. So, um, yeah, they, and you think about, you know, if you didn't have the Spirit, and you, you wouldn't, we, didn't, we wouldn't understand most of this. I mean, we'd be reading somebody else's letters, you know. That's right. So, Kevin, would you finish this up, please, sir? Timothy, my son, I am giving you this to command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them you may fight the battle well, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Among them, the... Anybody want to take a shot at it? I'm not even going to try I'm in okay. And Alexander, yeah. who I handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. All right. We're, we're not too sure what exactly they had done, but obviously it was bad enough that Paul previously had kicked them out of the church for their own good. Um, and we know in Matthew 18, the purpose of kicking somebody out of communion, out of church, out of um, you know, doing church discipline in that way is for the, not for punishment, for, but for reconciliation so that the person will eventually realize what they've done and come back. And so he's calling it here, delivered to Satan. Um, uh, but it's in hopes that they would realize what they did. They're stopping teaching their own stuff and, repent and come back so that was the the crust of the commentary that that i could gather uh, about the, the specific situation not too clear uh, unless you guys have commentary well, and, and also i think the word shipwreck pretty much sums it up i mean yeah it's like we would say, we say the, the boards and the timbers and there's holes uh -huh. everywhere and it it's pretty much useless yeah in in common terminology today, we'd say, "Oh, they're a car wreck." Okay, well, yeah. we're using shipwreck here. And as I understand, you know, as as we once studied, I think with with Doug and you, um, mm -hmm. the different steps to try to correct somebody. It's mm -hmm. between and it expands, and then it goes to the whole the whole congregation, and then after that, if you can't work it out, mm -hmm. they're pretty much um, don't come back until. You have your stuff together, yeah. right? It's in Matthew 18, yes, sir. Right. 
Uh, of course, we can't follow those if we have problems with somebody who's outside the church because they're not under that authority. <laughs>